Christoph's, Christoph's uh, classes tomorrow at 3, 3 for 7. Uh, this afternoon here is <laughs> So is, is what I wrote correct? Then <laughs> you can double check. Yeah. Okay. So So what I want to discuss now is basically start uh, the construction of, of these SLE processes. And um, uh, all of us who have given lectures on SLE processes, and probably also all of those who have uh, followed the course on SLE processes, um, probably know that it's not a trivial task uh, you know, to transmit the uh, well, to make sure that at the end of the course, everybody has a clear picture of what goes on and uh, doesn't forget it uh, too quickly. So, uh, so given the experience I have about this, I think I will first start with a non-formal approach. So I want you to, so the first thing I want to try before giving you the formal definition is an informal uh, description of what SLE is. And, uh, and then we'll move on uh, in the second part of the second part of the today to, to a more formal description. So remember here that what we are after. We are after trying to define a, a random curve that has this conform invariance and this uh, exploration property. So of course, what we use all the time is what uh, Christophe has uh, uh, described in, in, in past sessions as Riemann's mapping theorem, of course, that I have implicitly used already many times when I state that something is conforming invariance. Invariant is the fact that, well, two domains, D and D prime, uh, you know, there exists a three parameter family of possible maps, conformal maps from D onto D prime, uh, so angle preserving bijections from D onto D prime. So let, let me try to, you know, if I, if I would be a, a professional uh, American uh, professor uh, with, uh, who has to try to entertain the audience uh, with, uh, now I start saying a stupid uh, thing that is going to enter uh, history with being recorded, but, uh, uh, you know, has to entertain the audience uh, by all sorts of tricks. Uh, I would probably have been, or somebody would have helped me producing a special uh, cooking or pastry device so to make you the experiment in front of you to what I'm going to make, but I don't have these because in France, basically, if you want to show to the students that something is nice, uh, it's better to be slightly dry and have a sort of a uh, axiomatic attitude because otherwise it doesn't look serious or real mathematics. You have to show that you have to suffer a little bit so you, uh, for students to think that this is nice or nice mathematics. So imagine that you are in your kitchen, right, and you are cooking, uh, you have a, a pastry. Uh, okay, in the US it doesn't work because they are never in their kitchen cooking pastry or they don't know how to if it's done with butter or whatever, but they just buy it in the, <laughs> in the supermarket. Uh, okay, that was really stupid. Uh, <laughs> I apologize for <laughs> uh, So, okay, so you, have, you, have a, you want to, to cook a, a cake and, uh, and you have a round, uh, how do you say, uh, shape, right? Or to, cook, cooking, uh, to cook your, your cake and it's round. Now, what Riemann's mapping theorem tells you is that you have a very special paste, right, that you can distort like this. You know, you can move on, on the kitchen table to have it, to take it all sorts of, uh, all sorts of shapes. And, and what Riemann's mapping theorem tells you is that uh, imagine that, you have, that it has any shape like this and that you have a very fine grid. Uh, okay, in France we would say we are cooking a Galette de Roi or whatever. So you have a, a, a fine, fine mesh grid here. Right? Then there's a way to distort you know, your pastry in such a way 
that the image, uh, to put it back onto the circular shape in such a way that basically, of course, you have to distort things here. Uh, uh, so the, the, the real squares are not real squares because you have distorted things, but in such a way that whenever you have two things that crossed orthogonally here, they will still cross orthogonally here. So the Riemann mapping theorem is a very special way. It tells you that there's always a way to distort your pastry from any shape to the circle shape in a way that preserves this uh, uh, orthogonality of crossings of uh, small shapes there. And even more, what you can do is that you can assign, right, so that's, you can basically take three points here, right, and three points there, Right? And you can basically nail, you know, this point here, this point there, this point there. You know, you force these three points to be there. And then, basically, there's a unique way that all the rest of the, the pastry is going to adjust in order to have preserve this uh, orthogonality condition, right? So that's just Riemann's mapping theorem that tells you there exists a unique conformal map from this domain onto there that maps these three boundary points onto these three boundary points here. Uh, Prescribe is just basically you can view it as a special, you know, there exists a unique way to distort your pastry back onto the circle with nailing these three uh, boundary points on three prescribed boundary points in a, certain, in a certain way. And in fact, if you think a little bit about it, just a side remark is that if you would take these two infinitesimally close apart and these two infinitesimally close apart, this will still be true and you can let these go to become infinitesimally close. So what you could also do is instead of, you know, uh, prescribing the three points is sort of this prescribing just two points and some information about the derivative of the conformal map here and there. Okay, but that, we'll come back to that later. Okay, so remember what we are doing is we want to draw on our circular pastry a curve. We have two points A and B and we want to draw a curve from A to B a random curve. Because of our condition about exploration, it's very natural, you know, to draw it from A to B. It has this direction from A to B. So what the, the, way, the good way to think about it, uh, given this exploration uh, property that we have there, is that you are not drawing it, you are cutting, right? You take your scissors. Basically, that's, that's what you want to do, is you take scissors and you want to cut, op to cut at random uh, a path to cut open from A to B. Okay. Now, imagine that you want to cut, basically, find a procedure to cut open this pastry into, into two parts uh, in a way that sort of simulates this, uh, has conformal invariance and the exploration property. So what, what does the exploration property mean? You cut open a little bit. You know, I, you did sort of start cutting this open. So now what it tells you is that what remains to be done is basically to cut open from here to this in the remaining domain. And now it's clear in your mind, you know, the slit, because you have cut open the pastry, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that you are not in the domain, in the disk anymore, but you are in the slit disk where you have cut this open. Okay. So then, what the combination of these two things tell you is that it is very natural to define a conformal map, say, FT, right? Basically, that just you take, you have cut open your pastry, and you want to map it back onto your original, shape, onto your original frame, right? You want it back to make it back circular again, right? So it's, it's like you cut it open, and then you, you know, the, this is now open, so you, you, you want, this to be back on the, or, I mean, if, on the original boundary. So in a certain way, if you follow, I mean, if you remember these two colors here, this is white and this is green here, then what you do is basically you put it back, you want to put it back onto your original shape. And you do it in this way that basically now the, the green is here, the white is there. The, oh, sorry, this is B. This is A. And so you do it, FT is defined by being the unique way, you know, to map back the slit thing back onto your original uh, circular shape in a certain way that the image of this boundary point now is there. 
the image of this one here is there, and you require basically, say for instance, that the derivative of the conformal map near B is one, right? So that the infinitesimally closed guy here is uh, roughly infinitesimally closed on the other side at, at the same infinitesimal distance. Okay, so it's clear, you cut open, and then you, you know what you would do, you know, if you, if you have a, you are not able to glue things together, uh, because your pastry is, uh, you didn't put enough uh, butter or whatever, so, so the only thing you can do is distort the rest, uh, in order to, so that the boundary now becomes a, and of course, what you see when you do this, it's clear, uh, from your cooking experience, that something special happens near the tip, right? Because here the distortion will have something, you know, uh, the, the way to put it back, you have to force slightly something, some derivative will be infinite. Maybe if you are not careful enough, you know, something will, will uh, go wrong in, in, in your pastry or something. Okay. So, so you do this, and what the combination of conformal invariance and exploration is, if you want this scissor cutting procedure to simulate gamma, is precisely that the law of what remains to be cut here, the law of the yellow thing that you have to continue doing, is the same as the law of cutting open from A to B here. Right? Because first you say the law of what remains to be cut here is the law of the random curve from gamma t to B in the slit domain. But because of conformal invariance, if I map this conformally here, the law of this yellow curve in this domain is the same modulo the map FT as the law of the yellow curve in this domain. Okay, so just combination of these two things tell you what? Tell you that conditionally on, I toss at random this guy here. You know, you start cutting open. Conditionally on this thing, the law of the yellow thing here, which is the image of this remaining thing to be explored by this conformal map, which is a random conformal map, right? FT is just another way to encode the information about this slit here, gamma. Right? The law of the thing here is just the law of a random curve from A to B in the unit disk. And here we have, you see that the information about what the initial slit is has disappeared. So conditionally on the first slit, I map back what is the law of the remaining thing here to be done here. It's independent of my initial slit. Okay. So what you see here, the natural thing to do is to say, well, now I try to understand the next step here. You know, what the law of the, of the next thing up to time, say, 2t. Well, the natural thing to do is just to say, well, let's look at what it corresponds to here. And this guy is just uh, the beginning of a slit from A to B in my initial domain. So here, this blue guy, the law of the blue guy, is an independent copy of the law of the red guy here. Right? Both these things are just the beginnings of independent cut, open cutting of my, of my disk. Right? And so you see that what the, the, the natural way to understand you know, this curve here, the red plus the blue, is to use two independent uh, open cutting of a disk from A to B, and then how do you recover the blue guy here? So here you have, now I'm sorry with the frame of, of uh, recording, people will not be happy. Uh, so this you map back, so here you have a F tilde T, which is basically the thing that you cut open a second thing, and then you map back again, you know, by your pastry onto your original frame. So here now, you, if you look at what happens, if, if you, you know, imagine your scissors, you know, they have special colors. On the right-hand side, it colors everything on, into, in, 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 in green, and on the left-hand side, it colors here everything in white in the first attempt, and here in the second attempt, it colors everything on both sides in blue, say. What you will see when, when you map back here is that here you'll have something blue here that corresponds to, to, to this part here. And here you'll have something green that has been pushed away here and something white here that has been pushed away. Right? Because you cut open here, you map back, and then you cut open, and then so these white and green become separated by, by the blue slit. 
Now, the important thing is that this blue slit here and this red slit here follow the same law, but they are independent. So, which means another way to say is that this random conformal map FT, remember FT is a determinant, once you know gamma up to time T, is that defined deterministically by Riemann's mapping theorem, which is mapping this back. And F tilde T, which is the same object defined but using this, this part here, so you call it gamma tilde up to time T here, they follow the same law and are independent. So what you end up with naturally is to say that F, you want basically that F up to time 2T, this is this, the thing that removes, you, you do the slit up to time 2 times T, You want that f up to time 2 time t is just a copy of, I mean, a iteration of ft tilde with ft. You map back first by ft, and then you apply f tilde to what you have obtained here. Right? So just by this simple uh, thing, you see that the natural way to see f up to time 2t, or gamma up to time 2t, is not you know, to look at gamma like a two-dimensional curve that you draw in the, in the disk is to encode gamma by the conformal map F, because then what you see is that you have IID experiment and that you, you, know, you, do, you are always back into your original problem. You, know, you cut open, you map back, and you are back into your original problem. So what you see here is that, and of course, similarly, you might say that F n times t, you could continue this uh, n times, that this will be just you know, copies of F1 copies with F2t, copies of n, iterations of n independent copies of ft. Okay. So you see that when you try to combine these two properties here, it is very natural, you know, to, you, you see that there is something always stationary that you have to do, which is just, you know, understand how to cut open a disk or how to start to cut open a disk at random and that you are always going to iterate the same thing because of conformity variance plus exploration. So in particular, what this tells you, this is true for any t and any n, right? So in particular, this tells you that if t itself, right, you can view it as an iteration of n independent copies of the thing of corresponding to size t over n, right? So that means that the law of this red guy here could have been, you know, this red guy could have been simulated by first doing something very small here at random, map back, start again, something very small at random, and so on. So that ft itself, in a way, is, is some of, I mean, uh, iterations of independent copies of something corresponding to time t over n. Yes? Good question. So. I've, I have made it on purpose not to speak about the, what the right parameterization is at this point. This is just sort of, I, I would, so for those of you who have followed the Christoph's classes about H capacity and so on, and we, we come back to that in a moment about parameterization, but you know, then you already know what the right time parameterization is because there is a nice parameterization. What, basically what you want is that indeed the parameterization of this up to time 2t is obtained by basically iterating two independent copies of something that has size t in some way. And this is the h capacity seen from b that you, you, you need to use as a time parameter. Well, well, we'll come back to that later. So uh, what I, yes, so basically what I'm saying is that if you know the law of a very, you know, you know the law of this random, very, very small sized slit that, you know, this random thing you start with. You know the law of F epsilon for epsilon very small. You know the law of this random curve gamma up to time epsilon. So this is the law of something very, very small here near A. Okay. Then you can iterate it as many times as you want and you will get the, the law of the curve gamma at each multiples of the time epsilon, and then therefore you can get the law of the entire curve. Okay? So what I'm, selling, what I'm telling you is basically, once you have understood this, the fact that ft is obtained by iterating independent copies of something corresponding to a small, smaller slit, 
that the entire information about the law of the entire curve gamma right, is, in some sense, contained into the law of the random infinitesimal slit. What, how at random do you start with? Right. Okay. So, uh, so a good, a good, uh, I think a good. Um, and we, we come back to that later in a moment in a more formal way, but it hap it's, it's basically what, what is going to, what you can prove, and what I'll try to convince you of uh, in a moment, is that on infinitesimal level, you know, at the right order of uh, uh, magnitude that you want, in a way, so basically you are, what you need, look at this, right, you are iterating copies of, say, uh, F epsilon for ips a small epsilon, and you are iterating copies of f epsilon, one, et cetera. And you would expect that basically you need a, of order one of epsilon steps in order to get something macroscopic, right? Because of this uh, time parameterization that is well chosen. So in a certain way, what you need is only understand f epsilon up to order little o of epsilon, right? Because all the rest, you know, if you know that this is roughly something else up to order one over epsilon, and this is something else order of order one over epsilon, the mistake you make, you know, of order one or little o of epsilon, uh, will be only added up uh, of order one over epsilon times, and so therefore it will disappear in the limit when epsilon goes to zero. So what I'm saying is that in some sense, what you need to know is the law of the infinitesimal slit f seen, uh, you know, uh, f epsilon, where epsilon is very small, up to little o of epsilon mistakes. And it basically turns out, and this is just Leuvner's uh, 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 equation, and we'll explain that in a moment, that basically there's only a one parameter family of possible infinitesimal random slits that you can do. Right? That at first order, you know, at order little o of epsilon, uh, um, in order to describe the law of f epsilon when epsilon is very small, you need to know one real, I mean, one number. And the way to interpret this number, if you, if you, is, is very simple. Uh, it's basically, um, okay, I, I, I don't like this example, but uh, the, this way of describing, but in a way it's, it's, I think it's the one when one, where one understands it better. In, in some sense, okay, here's one strategy to cut open from A to B, right? Just to imagine that A and B, you know, are, oppo on, are sort of on the diameter of the disk, that you cut straight, okay? That's one way to cut open, and that satisfies the, the, the pres prescribed thing. So in a way, in the disk, I cut straight, and if I'm not on the disk, I take the conformal image of the straight line in the disk. Right, you know, you cut straight, no problem. Now, maybe you are doing some little mistake. You're not exactly able to cut straight. You know, you are doing some, uh, there is some random effect uh, that makes it, maybe, you know, on microscopic scale, you don't cut exactly uh, open. You make a little mistake, and maybe then this mistake will propagate when you map back, you know, progressively. So, one way to think about it is to say, well, you, have, you are shaking, right? So you, you are not able, you know, to really cut straight. And so if you shake a little bit, right? So if you make little mistakes on, on small scale, then basically the curve that you will get, get is not going to be the straight line. So that will be if you don't shake at all. And then if you shake a little bit, you know, maybe you will have something that is fairly close to the straight line. And if you shake more and more, if your intensity of shaking is, is larger and larger, then, then basically what the, the, the picture or the curve that you will draw will be more and more convoluted. And the way to encode this uh, intensity of shaking uh, basically is just via one, a, a real number, just the intensity of, the, of, of your shaking, and, and that you can see on infinitesimal level already. It tells you basically on infinitesimal level how much does this conformal map uh, f epsilon here that you, this little slit here of corresponding to gamma or to size epsilon, how much does it differ from a straight line if you want? 
So for those, probably some of you who have followed uh, Christophe's lecture on, on the, uh, you know, uh, beginning of Leuven equation, half plane capacity, and things like that, and the very last thing he done probably rings some bells. Saying you don't probably don't see exactly the relation, but see it has something to do with with uh, what he was talking about. The fact that the, you can approximate, you know, a straight slit. How much does a conformal map differ from a conformal map corresponding to a straight slit uh, up to some order? So, uh, so here it is. So basically, the result, I mean, the intuitive result, and we try try to now to describe it uh, rigorously, is on infinitesimal level when epsilon goes to zero at the order of precision that you want to understand this f epsilon. There's just one real number that you need in order to understand, to define the, this entire law of this f epsilon. And this number is, OK, it's usually called kappa. And you can really view kappa as the intensity of shaking uh, of, your, of your hand. And of course, you are not shaking as we are shaking, because uh, you might say then, then you are shaking in a conformally invariant way, right? Because you, you cut open infinitesimally here, and the way you're going to shake a bit later on is not, you know, according to your intensity. It's you first map back, and then you shake as if uh, with the same intensity, but here, not, not here. So, so you have this number kappa. And intuitively, OK, kappa is really just that, you know, this uh, intensity of shaking when you try to cut open. And when kappa is 0, means you don't shake at all. You cut straight. That's exactly the straight line I was talking about. And if kappa is very small, then you are pretty, I mean, the, 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 the random curve you define in this way is a curve of fractal dimension that will turn out to be close to 1 and to, uh, will remain pretty close to the straight line. Now. The larger kappa is, the more you shake, the more convoluted this curve is, is going to be. And uh, the more, um, and the fractal dimension basically of this random curve will increase with, with the shaking. So there's a theorem which is not easy, which is basically for each intensity of shaking, I mean, for each fractal dimension between 1 and 2, you can associate exactly one intensity of shaking kappa such that the fractal dimension of the curve you obtain in this way, so you you draw a random curve this way, but it will always have the same fractal dimension. It will always have the dimension uh, 1 plus kappa over 8. Okay. That's uh, how, how it goes. So in some, some sense, the dimension of the, the curve will increase linearly with the intensity of shaking of, of your procedure. OK. Now, maybe we try to be more uh, specific and more mathematical. This is sort of the, the intuition you should have in, 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 in order to understand what SLE is and how, what we want to define. Right. And it's clear here that because of this you know, pastry story, that really it is natural. You know, if you want to understand a random process, uh, it is the most natural thing to do is, is to view this as iteration of random conformal maps with IID sequences and so on. Of course, here we start you know, to, to dip our foots in, into some things where uh, you, you may try, you want to, to express, say, this uh, process here uh, in a more analytical or algebraic or sort of, uh, ways. You know, say, it's a what is the generator of the process? What space do you, does, it, uh, does it live in? And so on. And of course, here what you see is that the space of conformal maps is large large space. Uh, so you're living in a large space, anyway, not a finite dimensional space. And the second important thing, of course, to keep in mind is that, you know, composing conformal map is not a commutative thing, right? If you compose f with g, it's not the same as composing g with f. So uh, you, what you will end up here by looking at what happens on infinitesimal level is having to play with some Lie algebras and, you know, not very complicated uh, issues, but you start playing, you know, with iterating always the same thing, like what we're used to do when we do Brown in motion or uh, Levy processes, you know, just at each sequence you add a layer of, of independent stuff, except that you are going to compose it, and composing conformal math is not something linear. 
you're not taking the mean of, of it, you're, uh, so you will have sort of nonlinear effects and, and, and things like that. However, uh, there's a way, you know, a conformal map can always be expressed as a power series. For instance, you know, you can do the power series expansion in the neighborhood of B of the conformal map. So you have A0, A1, A2, and so on. And you will see how, how the A1 moves, how A, A, A0 moves, A1 moves, A2 moves. And there, locally, for the evolution of A0, A1, A2, and so on, these are evolutions, you know, of uh, things that are Markov, in a way, in, in the natural filtrations, and that live in each of the AIs is in the finite dimensional space. It lives in R. And therefore, there, you, you have some, you can view sort of this uh, evolution of the conformal map Fn as sort of an in, uh, diffusion in an infinite dimensional space with given uh, uh, interactions between the ANs. OK, we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. We'll see that. So how do you want to proceed now to, do, to make sense rigorously uh, out of this? So first of all, there's one thing. OK, I use the disk uh, because uh, it's natural to think of pastries in, in, with uh, forms of disks. But uh, there's another shape that is much better suited, that is much more, uh, much nicer in a way than disks. And the shape, uh, of course, uh, in terms of pastry is slightly problematic, but uh, in terms of mathematics it's not a problem. It's the upper half plane. Right? Remember, there's a Riemann map from the disk into the upper half plane, uh, which is uh, trivial uh, to consider. So we may say that instead of cutting open a, a the disk into two pieces, we are cutting open the upper half plane. And the first boundary point, which is image of A, is zero. And the image of A is, uh, I mean, B is at infinity. Because it's a boundary point of, of the upper half plane, a special boundary point is infinity. Why is the upper half plane nicer in some respect than the disk? Well, it's just because. In the upper half plane, basically seen from B, or seen from infinity, all the points, all the other points on the real line play the same role. It's quite clear, you know, there, there's a natural thing that you can do is just translate everything by, by a real, real function and, and, and you will still be in the upper half plane. Whereas here, seen in the disk, you know, all the points here on the other side of the disk, uh, seen from B, they do not play exactly the same role. So the symmetry, you know, the Möbius symmetry sort of uh, that of the conformal maps that leave B invariant uh, is sort of simpler to see in the upper half plane than in the disk. And you will see in a moment why, why it's nicer to do things in the upper half plane. OK, so now you start cut, cutting open a little something here. Right? You have gamma up to time t. Uh, and we define Ft, which is the conformal map that maps back Ft of gamma t is 0, and Ft of infinity is infinity, and F prime t of infinity is 1. So what I mean by that is the following, is that when you have a conformal map like this from where you remove something compact from the upper half plane and you move it back onto the upper half plane. If you, so probably these are things that uh, Christophe has uh, discussed, but uh, it is easy to see that if you do sort of an ex Taylor expansion near infinity here, that in some sense the function will be analytic in the neighborhood of infinity. So in other words, if you would define, say, uh, capital F T of Z, which would be 1 over F t of 1 over z, right? So you're just composing things to map so that infinity, instead of being at infinity, is not infinity, but it's at 0. Maybe you put a minus to have the upper half plane always in the upper half plane. What you will see is that this map is basically removing something. So the image of gamma will be some, some, something like that. So infinity, the image of infinity is here. And you're mapping this back into the upper half plane. So it's a conf this map, capital F, is, is doing this. And because of what we call Schwarz reflection, uh, uh, it is easy just to define, to extend this conformal map 
into a conformal map that is symmetric with respect to the, this real axis here into a conformal map, basically that maps here a neighborhood of infinity into a neighborhood of, okay, it's zero here, of zero here in an analytic way. So therefore, this little symmetry argument applied to, to, to this capital F tells you basically for free or without a lot of effort, so, or at least with the first, you know, first year complex analysis course, the fact that this, such a function ft necessarily has a, an expansion at infinity. And so it has an expansion like, you know, a0 plus oh, a0z plus a1 plus, okay, maybe I should, uh, a minus 1 plus a1 over z plus etc. when z goes to infinity. And all these numbers a here are real numbers because they correspond, because near infinity, you know, you, this function ft has to preserve the real line near infinity, so all the terms of the expansion when you apply it to a real number have to give rise, I mean, the, the image of a real number is a real number, so it tells you that the, all these numbers here have to be real. Now the choice, this normalization just means that we choose ft in such a way that a1 is, is 1. And so we can do that by Riemann's mapping theorem. We know that for any t like this, there exists a unique conformal map ft, such that that maps the complement of the slit here back to the upper half plane in such a way that infinity goes to infinity. a1 here is 1. And uh, say uh, a the image of gamma t is zero. Right? So that's Riemann's mapping theorem applied uh, to these uh, slit domains with these boundary points. Now, if you have followed, uh, so of course this is true for any t. For any given t, you have a Laurent expansion. So you might say that uh, a zero depends on t, a one depends on t, and so on. For each t, you have a function ft, and ft has a Laurent expansion, and, and you say a0 of t, a1 of t, and so on. So let's see if there's a way to interpret this a0 and a1 and so on. I'm, I'm really slow, but on, the, on some hand, this is important to understand what this goes. If I go too fast, then it doesn't make any sense. Let us try to understand what a0 means and what a1 means in the, for this conformal map. Well, remember, I just said that uh, there's a conformal map. I mean, uh, if you say, if you take ft, right, and you move ft by a real number, positive or negative, it just means, in some sense, to shift uh, the image of what you see here. So it corresponds in some way to shift the original uh, curve by a, by a constant. So. Um, so the information that you see in A0, right, roughly speaking, is a, of course, it's just one number. But it tells you, in some sense, if, you know, if gamma would be growing, say, to the left here, in some sense, it tells you how much to the left of 0 is gamma t. And so by how much, seen at infinity, do you have to shift things back to the origin to have the image back at 0? Roughly. So roughly speaking, this number A0 tells you how much the gamma you know, has deviated to the right or to the left. How much in some uh, informal sense, but uh, that's one way to understand what A0 means. So A0 is a real number. It can be positive or negative. Now, what does A1 mean? So A1 of t, so for those of you who know, uh, who have followed uh, Christoph's class, is what is called the half-plane capacity. Although I don't know if you use this one or the half of this one, of gamma up to time t. So this is with quotation mark anyway, because it's not really a capacity. But uh, So um, Christophe, did you do it? Uh, do you say this is two times the half plane capacity of one half of a? This is what you call half plane. OK. So the. Maybe I say one word about it. So, 
So what I want to explain now uh, in, in a few seconds is two properties of A1 of t. The first one it is that, that is a positive real number. No, it's not like A0 can be positive or negative. It's a positive number. That's the first remark. And the second remark is that it is going to be strictly increasing with t and continuous. So A1 of t is going to be an increasing fun It's a function that is increasing with time. And in some sense, the way, natural way to, to understand this terminology is just say A1 of t is a way to measure the size. Of course, it's just a real number, so it captures just one information about, this, about the size. But in some sense, it's a way to measure the size of the slit seen from infinity. You have somebody sitting at infinity, and he tries to say, well, OK, how big is the slit now? OK, it is. And you won't say, well, it's going to be A1. That's just one, made to, one natural way to measure size. So the, the way to, 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 to make sense of, of this would be, for instance, to say that A1 of t would be the limit when y goes to infinity plus infinity. Is that the way you draw things? Okay. Of y times uh, the expected height, let's see, imaginary value of b tau, with b0 is i uh, y. So what do I mean by that? You have your slit here. And here, I have the point i times y. You start a Brownian motion from here. And you stop it at the first time you exit your slit domain. So you stop it at the first time you exit, you hit the, re the red thing. That's what you call b tau. Now, what happens is that, uh, OK, this was the exercise session. I'm not going to do it uh, again. But basically, first of all, that when you let y go to infinity here, or not exercise session, course session, or, okay, uh, the, probab the probability that you will hit the slit and not exit the domain by on the real line will be of order uh, 1 over y. Right? That's just by some trivial scaling argument. So with probability of order 1 over y, uh, yes, you will hit the slit here, and otherwise you will be there. So you note that when you, don't hit, when you exit the red domain by the, on the real line and not on the slit, the imaginary part of b tau is 0. Right? So the only contribution to this expectation, this expected height here, comes from the fact what happens when b hits the slit. Okay. And, and then it's just you know, the f a nice, simple application of martingale convergence uh, or stopping uh, theorem for, martingale, for bounded martingales, that is going to tell you basically that uh, if you let this evolve, if you follow this, then this thing will evolve like a martingale with respect to the position where you actually are. If you, when, you, when you start, you know the expected height, what, where is the expected height when you start is just, uh, is, is just uh, this quantity. And when you end up, you, 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 you have the imaginary part of b tau. Now, the point is that if you apply the conformal map phi to this picture, the imaginary part of phi will be harmonic because of properties of uh, imaginary functions. And therefore, what you will see, you can apply, OK. Uh, the expansion that you have over, yeah, sorry. Uh, that's what I forgot. Uh, the fact that f here is a, uh, is a is harmonic makes it possible to express this in terms of an expansion of ft uh, at infinity. OK, I don't want to, to, maybe this is homework exercise for those who weren't here the other day. It doesn't make sense if I just reproduce uh, what has been done before. Uh, and for those of you who weren't at Christoph's session, uh, you can always uh, uh, discuss with me or Christoph or look up uh, in the, any lecture notes on, uh, Brown in, on SLE where this is the first thing you do. So the important thing is that here, in this definition, it's quite obvious that this is a positive number. It's a real positive number because, uh, uh, well, because the imaginary part of beta is anyway or can only be positive. 
So it has this property that is a positive number, and it has the, prob the, 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 the property, which is that if I compose, say, if I imagine that I have a conformal map FT of Z, which starts as Z plus A0 plus A1 over Z plus, sorry, take a function F like this. And I have another function F tilde, like, you know, we had before, F tilde of Z, which this time has an expansion at infinity, which is Z tilde plus A0 tilde plus A1 tilde over Z plus etc. Now the point is, when I compose F and F tilde, what happens to the A0 and A1s? So if I do F composed with F tilde of Z, okay, I don't write it because this is sort of obvious, uh, what happens is that you will get Z, first order, of course, F and F tilde are just Z. Now, if you look at the second order term, the constant term will just be A0 tilde plus A0. The second order term will just be A1 plus A tilde 1 over Z. Plus, and here you have a little O of 1 over Z. So the moment where things, you know, the A0 and A1s become, you know, to get mixed and mess up together, only happens at the next order term. Okay. So you just do this, and it's two lines to be convinced by what I just said. So this tells you what? This is already telling you here that in this picture over there, A0 of t is increasing strictly. Because if you look at, remember, imagine you, I take a slit here. No, A1 of t is strictly increasing because I take gamma up to time t and then I take up to time t plus s. Okay? And I define my conformal map ft and ft plus s uh, as before. What you see here is that A1 of t plus s is just A1 of t, which is strictly positive, plus this A tilde 1 of s Right, because you first map this back by ft, and then, okay, I did it the other way around over there, but it's the same. And then, uh, and then you have the image here of ft of gamma from t to t plus s that comes here. And the, and the a1 of this guy here is also strictly positive. So it tells you that this guy is just the sum of two strictly positive things. First, the size of this slit here, and the size of this slit here. And this tells you the size, in terms of defined as being A1, of the union of these two things. Okay. So it tells you two things. First of all, that the A1s are strictly increasing positive when you, when you let the, the, the slit grow. And uh, yes, and it's also because of this definition, it's quite clear, even though it may be cl look clearer than it actually is, that A1 of t is increasing continuously. There are no jumps in A1. OK, so, um, so a consequence here is that if gamma is a, you know, gamma, if you have a curve gamma t that increases, that goes into the upper half plane like this, that A0, that A1 of t is an increasing uh, continuous function of t. Now, here comes the answer to the question about time parameterization. Here we see that maybe it's clever to time parameterize gamma by this, no, by this increasing thing. You know, if you have an increasing function, A1, that is strictly increasing and continuous, you can just you know, time change gamma in such a way that this A1, instead of being uh, some, something that in increases in a strange way, increases linearly. So we can always choose, always define the time parameterization in such a way that A1 of t 
is equal, okay, that's historically, for historical reasons, two times t, it's not t. So it is possible, uh, you know, you have this increasing curve, it's parameterized, you don't know how, how, but it's increasing in the upper half plane. And now we say, well, okay, we don't like this time parameterization, we choose another one, which is the one such that the size seen from infinity, defined as being this A1 number, increases like two times t. Okay, so, That's what we have so far. Now, uh, okay, here I have gamma t. Okay, now may, maybe now I, I do something else. Now, uh, one can prove, and it's and it's not very difficult, and probably you are going to buy this uh, uh, fairly uh, easily that if gamma is a continuous curve that grows in the upper half plane, and if you look at the evolution of A0, right, that the function t gives A0 of t is also continuous. You know, because if, if it would have a discontinuity, it would mean that, you know, suddenly you, you shift the entire conformal map by... Uh, by uh, some constant, which would mean that, you know, instead of growing here, now you start growing there, but because the curve is continuous, you might, this will not happen. Okay, we'll come back to that later, because gamma is continuous. So, so let's, so you see, we do things step by step. We have a continuous growing curve. Everything we've done so far is, has nothing to do with uh, probability theory. It's just say, I have a continuously growing curve. I can parameterize, change the parameterization in such a way that A1 increases linearly. Okay. Now we are back to our original problem, which is, okay, what we want is a continuously random, continuous increasing curve. And because of the same reason here, so here we have A1 is increasing linearly because of the sum of positive increasing things. Now, if, let's just look at with the, with the time parameterization that we chose, which is the size seen from infinity is increasing linearly, what happens to the A0 of t? Okay. So what happens to the function t gives A0 of t? So what are the properties that this function are satisfying? Well, first of all, so it is a random continuous function. Continuous, real valued function with a0 of t equals 0. Okay. Because f0 is identity. So, so so this is it, right? It's not a h. Now, it satisfies the pro following property, which is that for any given t, the law of a t plus s minus okay, a zero of t plus a zero of t s positive is equal to the law of a zero of t of, of s. Let's put it this way. Sorry. Uh, the conditional law of A0 of T plus S minus A0 of T given Uh, Ft, which will be the information of gamma up to time t, right? If I condition on gamma up to time t, right? We said that Ft of gamma 
of the remaining thing that has to be explored has the same law than the initial problem. That's the, I mean, this exploration plus Markov property. So translated in A0, it means that now this is, has the same law as an independent copy of A0 of T, A0 of S. So all I'm saying here is the following. I condition up to time T, right? I map back by LIFT, right? And I'm saying that this thing here, which will be gamma tilde of S, is the image of gamma up to T plus S here, okay? That's just because the time parameterization is such, it's chosen exactly in such a way that this is what happens. Now, the A0 of this guy plus the A0 of T, because we compose this with uh, F tilde S, is the A0 of T plus S. So A0 of T plus S minus A0 of T is the A0 of this blue guy, which is, has the same law as the one you started with, but it's an independent copy. So there are not that many continuous processes that satisfy this. You want a real value continuous process, and this tells you that it has independent increments. That's what it means. Okay. So what, what do we know continuous uh, processes with the uh, independent increments? So independent increments is what you call Levy processes or something like that. If you want it also to be continuous, basically there's just, it's brown in motion, possibly with a drift. Right. So it's brown in motion running at a certain speed, plus uh, a certain plus a drift. Now there's an additional property here that we want to be true, uh, which comes from the fact that we want the curve gamma that we define in the upper half plane to be scale invariant. If I see gamma and I see the gamma scale by a factor lambda, it still has to be the same law on random curves. This is just because Remember, we had three points to choose, and we chose arbitrarily the fact that we chose a conformal map that is normalized at infinity. So conformal invariance applied to, on the one hand side, the conformal map, I mean the domain D with boundary point zero infinity, and on the other side, the domain, the upper half plane also with the same boundary points, and the conformal map between the two, which is multiplying by a positive constant, so blowing up the curve gamma, just tells you that the, curve, the law of the curve gamma has to be scale invariant. Okay. And if you look at what the t time parameter, what happens to the time parameterization and what happens to uh, the parameterization of uh, A0 and A1, what you see is that this additional constraint tells you that A0 of T must have the same scaling property and brown in motion. So this is telling you that uh, the only choice for A0 is brown in motion running at a certain speed. So here you see, so how, how is it with time? Can I go to half past or? Hmm? Okay. So the, the well, because I want to say what is going to be the theme of Christoph's tomorrow lecture. Another way to be convinced of the fact, if you don't like this, I've been slightly too fast here about this uh, scaling property, you might also think, okay, if we look at this, say, scaling inverse of percolation picture or something, in the upper half plane, you have a left-right symmetry, right? You don't go more to the left than to the right. The law of the curve gamma and its, its symmetric image with respect to the imaginary half line should be the same. And so this is already telling you that the, if there's a drift, then the drift has to be zero. 
So these two, these one and two tell you that A0 of t is like a Brownian motion plus constant time t. And this constant has to be zero because of some additional argument. So what we got so far is that if gamma is a simple curve growing in the upper half plane, right, then if you parameterize it by uh, half plane capacity, then A0 of t has to be like a Brownian motion running at a certain speed. So kappa is a positive constant, and beta a real valued Brownian motion. Now the claim is that, in fact, and this is a deterministic claim, if that you can reconstruct if you have forgotten all the information about the curve gamma, but you only have kept the information about this A0, this one real valued function A0 of t, you can actually recover gamma. That the entire information about this two-dimensional curve gamma is encoded in A1, A0. So you may say, well, this looks, this looks weird because you have a two-dimensional information that is encoded in a one-dimensional curve. It's not weird at all. This type of thing you have seen before. You know, uh, if, I, if you have, say, a two-dimensional smooth curve, right? Okay, it's a two-dimensional curve, but if you, if you decide, okay, I parameterize it well by, by the fact that, and that's what we did here, we choose a proper time parameterization by, its, say, of arc length then the entire information about this two-dimensional curve will be uh, contained in the derivative with respect to arc length of this two-dimensional curve. And this one moves on, on, on the unit circle because it's an arc length parameterization, which is a one-dimensional thing. So if at each time I tell you in which direction to go, uh, then you have a two construct a two-dimensional smooth curve out of a one-dimensional curve. So here it's similar, right? You, you force the time parameterization to be this thing measured by capacity, and then this two-dimensional curve can be coded in some way by some directional information given by the, 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 the way A0 moves. And in, indeed, it's exactly the, the way it is, because this curve gamma is, is growing inside this domain like this. Right? And between here you are here time t, and I told you A0 is the, the, or A0 between t and t plus s, the way it fluctuates tells you if you turn more to the right or to the left. So in some sense, the information of how A0 fluctuates between t and t plus epsilon is just telling you if you go slightly here or there. So it's really intuitively, except that it's viewed conform in a conform invariant way, it's exactly as this thing about R, I mean, parameterizing by arc length and deciding to turn more to the right or to the left. It's, it's a similar picture. So, and how do you prove that, in fact, A0 uh, encodes the entire information about the curve? It goes as follows. And so, given that time is short, and I see, feel that there is some pressure to not to be too much over time, that, um, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, so here's the theorem. And uh, it's much more general than what we need in some sense, but it's, maybe it's simpler to encode it in this linear way. Uh, uh, well, maybe it's not so good. Okay, and I'm, let me, let, I'm not going to quote the theorem. I'm going to do two things. The first remark, one remarks, one proves, one, so define GT of Z, right, which is a slight variation It's, it's not exactly a uh, ft, it's just ft shifted. So we say this is ft of z minus a0 of t. So another way to view fgt of z is the conformal map. So we have the slit that grows here. So ft was the guy that puts you back to the origin, that gamma to the origin. So now gt is the conformal map that maps this domain back to the original half plane. But this time gt at infinity satisfies z plus little o of, of uh, well, plus 2t over z plus little o of 1 over z. I mean, it's f shifted in, a, you know, this way, in such a way that the a0 term disappears. So in other words, 
It's like, it's like for Riemann's mapping theorem, except that now you prescribe the value at infinity, you prescribe the first derivative at infinity, which has to be one, and in some sense you prescribe something that looks like a second derivative at infinity. It's not really a second derivative, it's more like a Schwarzschild derivative, but it's, it's, it's you, 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 you prescribe a second thing. So when you do this, now gt, the image of gamma t, is not zero anymore, it's gt of gamma t now is minus a zero of t. And in fact, here, for convenience, of course, beta and minus beta have the same role, so it's better to say that a zero of t is minus a Brownian motion beta running at speed kappa t. So what happens now is the following remark, and now this is exactly something Christophe has been describing in, in his last, last uh, 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 session, which is what happens is that if you fix Z fixed, look at GT of Z when, Z, uh, when T goes to zero. Right. Now the claim is that, so this T goes to zero and Z is fixed, so it's a little bit like if this guy size would be fixed and z goes to infinity. Uh, and what happens is that basically what you can prove is that gt of z, regardless of the shape of this little slit, right, provided it's sort of continuously in, and grows out of, of zero here, that gt of z looks like as t goes to zero. Uh, t goes to zero. That's seen from far away. This very small, of course, at some point we have to use this argument that I vaguely sketched at some point, that there's just a one-dimensional po direct possible direction you know you can move on infinitesimals. Uh, so here, this is where, where this happens, which is basically, if your z is far away, t is very small. Now, seen from here, the conformal map GT is almost the same as what you would see if you would have, instead of a, this slit gamma, a straight slit of the same size. Remember that the conformal map that removes a slate straight slit above zero uh, is just square root of z squared plus four times epsilon. I guess that would be uh, four times uh, four times t. If you have a straight slit that moves up like this, you parameterize it by, uh, according to this half-plane capacity, uh, and you get basically that the conformal map that removes the slit of size t is this one. That's an explicit computation. And you know that when t goes to zero, this will be like z plus 2t over z. Just do the expansion when t goes to zero of this thing. And therefore, what this, this tells you that up to first order, the conformal map that removes this slightly distorted slit and this straight slit, uh, up to first order with respect to t, they are the same. Okay? So what this tells you, so this, I think, has, you proved it in the last session. And so what this tells you is that the conformal map gt satisfies this. When t goes to zero, you can differentiate this with respect to t, and you get two over z, right? Because it's just gt of z minus z divided by t, right? g zero of z is z. So divided by t, you let t go to zero, and you get exactly this. Now, we have the stationarity of increments. So, Imagine now that you, you play the same game here, but we apply this property here to what happens between t and t plus epsilon. So here we have g tilde epsilon. You grow a little bit, and here you have this guy here. So the derivative when t goes to zero of this g tilde epsilon is two over z. But here, when you look at the derivative with respect to t at another point here, so when you take gt 
plus epsilon minus of z minus gt of z over epsilon. So we let take the limit, the derivative with respect to t, but at the later time, t of the conformal map gt. What you see here is that this will hold applied to g, to g tilde. And this result applied to g tilde just means that you get here, you have to replace the argument z by gt over z minus wt. Uh, minus, sorry, beta kappa t. Or f a0 of t. Right? Because this is ft of z. OK? So oh, this converges, sorry, when epsilon goes to 0 to that. So exactly the same argument we had here, except that we applied at a later time between t and t plus epsilon, and we applied it at, at that moment, you get this equation. So what you get here for free is that for any z, is 2 over gt of z minus beta kappa t. Okay. Now, here's the miracle. I told you if I know a0, I can recover the entire curve of gamma. Right. Intuitively, it was clear because of our sort of directional information. You grow in a certain direction. Here, we see that this, if I know this quantity here. If I fix z and I let t vary here, this is just an ordinary differential equation with respect to gt. For each fixed z, gt of z, so t gives gt of z, solves a simple ODE. Of course, it's not so simple because it's not linear, but it's still no problem. This ODE will be well defined up to the time maybe possible time where basically the deriv derivative here that you get here blows up. This only happens when gt of z hits beta kappa t. Okay. So this defines gt of z up to maybe an explosion time. So gt of z is well defined up to a possible explosion time. Now, now there are several ways to see that this will give you the information about the entire curve gamma back, because uh, this explosion type will, never, will not happen before a given time t0, if z, provided z is high enough and uh, in the upper half plane. So intuitively speaking, what is happening is that I have z here, you know, and it solves, the gt of z solves this already differential equation, so it, go, it goes down like this. And, and, and this uh, beta running at speed kappa t is moving on the real line, so they will hit, uh, gt will sort of stop being well-defined, gt of z will stop being well-defined only basically if the curve gamma, you know, goes through this point z at some point. That's what happens, you know, if, if the curve gamma here, you have z here, gt of z is always well defined, but maybe it, it stops being well defined if z is sort of uh, hit, hit by, the, by the curve gamma. Otherwise, it continues to be well defined. So if you know the, all the information about gt near infinity, you have the asymptotic expansion, Laurent expansion near infinity of gt of z. So you have the entire conformal map gt, and therefore you have gamma, because uh, gt is defined in terms of a renormalized conformal map that removes the slit gamma up to time t. Okay, now I, I realize that I've been slightly quick towards the end, so pro probably we'll have to, to do some uh, uh, refreshing again uh, next time about this. So what Christophe is going to do tomorrow is to ask the following question. If you start with any continuous function a0 of t, forget about the Brownian motion, you start with a continuous function a0 of t, you solve this ordinary differential equation. This defines for you some, some conformal map GT. What objects does it, def does it define always a continuous curve gamma or not? And if not, what sort of guys does this procedure define? 
and there's a sort of a, a precise description of what time of objects uh, this procedure constructs. However, what we've seen here is that if you have a continuous curve that is growing in the upper half plane, then necessarily, uh, I mean, if it's a random continuous curve satisfying our properties, necessarily A0 has to be a Brownian motion running at a certain speed. And necessarily, GT solve this ordinary differential equation can be recovered out of beta. Okay. So the definition of SLE kappa is basically define, so you go backwards, right? You define, a, you define the WT equals Brownian motion running at a speed kappa. Right? And then define GT in the upper half plane to be the function defined by this equation. So for each z, you solve this ordinary differential equation. This constructs something, some conformal map GT for you. And what sort of what it does construct is uh, each conformal map GT corresponds to a geometric object in the upper half plane, and this is what is called SLE. So I haven't told you for the moment that this defines a continuous curve gamma. It's just that this procedure defines something. Maybe it's a continuous curve. Maybe it's something else. You'll see tomorrow. But it defines something which, and which is well defined, at least. Right? You start with uh, the this function, you solve this ordinary differential equation. And if you know that uh, the scaling limit, say, of these interfaces exist, then you, you expect that it is one of these guys that you have defined. OK. So I, I realize the end was slightly uh, uh, confusing, especially t because it was also the end of the lecture, so you get hungry and tired. But um, we'll come back to that uh, on Tuesday anyway. But at least I believe the, the, the first part, sort of the intuitive impression of what, how you define you, you want to approach these uh, iterations, I mean these random curves by iterations of conformal map in, that are independent and accumulating like this is clear. And I hope to make the end of this lecture clearer by Tuesday. So again, so tomorrow morning will be something completely different only for those of you who uh, know a little bit about the easing model. So if you don't know about the easing model and want, still want to come to morning, more, tomorrow morning, then uh, I don't know. Did, these notes, they are OK. If you read French, then you can try to read the, the beginning of the part on easing uh, in, the, in two dimensions or something like that. But uh, otherwise, you can also just come to have an impressionistic uh, idea of what goes on. I mean, the goal maybe will be to focus on two things. Uh, the first thing is just, OK, Smirnoff's idea how to make, you know, where does conformal invariance appear in some other model, which is this easing model, how dip, to see that it's different, but it has a similar flavor than what you saw in percolation. And also to try to clarify uh, what plays the role, in some sense, in for easing of Russo Simo Welsh, because you have been doing a lot of Russo Simo Welsh uh, and tightness type uh, stories. So, what replaces this in other models? <laughs>